Coming up, Schiaparelli splats on Mars. Cygnus bursts to the International Space Station. I have an interview with Emery Stagmer about small sats. And I've got comments from Mastin on the moon. All that and more coming up on this episode of Tomorrow. Hello and welcome to Tomorrow, episode 9.35 for October 29th, 2016. Now, before we get started with the show, we, of course, want to thank our Tomorrow Premier Patron members. These folks have given us $10 or more per episode as we crowdfund our shows here of Tomorrow. Now, these folks get access to everything, including our Slack channel. And if you would like to help crowdfund the shows of Tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. And I am your host for the news portion, Jared Head. And next to me, sort of sort of next to me, but not in person, is <laughs> Space Mike, our reporter from Arizona. So very glad to have you on today, Space Mike. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. And we're going to go ahead and get started by going to a place that looks a little bit like Arizona, which is Mars. And some of the bad news coming from Mars, unfortunately, about the European Space Agency's Schiaparelli lander. Um, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has imaged the area that was originally seen where a black spot appeared. Um, and as you can see, it's a little bit more than just a black spot. It's more a black splat. And in fact, that is the area where the Schiaparelli lander impacted the surface of Mars likely exploding, and data shows that the supersonic parachute was deployed for landing, but then it jettisoned early, and the retro rockets fired for much shorter than expected. So they think that there was some sort of a software issue there. So looking at these three images there, on the left, you have the back shell with the parachute. In the middle is what is left of Schiaparelli, and then to the right there is the forward heat shield that was deployed. Now the crater left over is about 2.5 meters across and 50 centimeters deep, and it's consistent with the high-speed impact of some the size of the probe. So there you go. That's where Schiaparelli ended up on Mars. Now, speaking of uh, some good stuff, let's get back to some good news while we're at it, Space Mike. Tell us what we got going on in orbit around the Earth. Well, uh, the Cygnus vehicle, Orbital ATK Cygnus cargo vehicle, docked to the space station on Sunday. And it had to loiter in orbit for a little while. This one is designated OA-5, and it was birthed to the International Space Station by Kate Rubens and Takuya Onishi using the Canadian robotic arm on Sunday, October 23rd at 1128 Coordinated Universal Time. Now, this was Orbital ATK's seventh Cygnus vehicle and the first to launch on the upgraded Antares-230 rocket, as well as using the Castor 30 x Excel upper stage. And as I said, this Cygnus had to loiter in the area around the space station for a few days, waiting for the Soyuz MS-02 spacecraft to dock to the International Space Station first, which uh, we talked about last week. And even though Cygnus launched before the MS-02, uh, before going through the final rendezvous procedures. But uh, it was able to rendezvous with the station and uh, berth successfully, and it will remain at the space station until November 18th, when the spacecraft will be used to dispose of several tons of trash during its fiery re entry into Earth's atmosphere and conduct the uh, spacecraft fire experiment that Lisa Stojanovsky has talked about in her space pods quite a bit. So very cool stuff. And this is probably my favorite shot of the, uh, the, the spacecraft just uh, being wheeled right into place. It looks like something out of a science fiction movie, but that's real footage. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just really happy for this. And congratulations to NASA and Orbital ATK for this uh, successful mission. Yeah, great to have them return to flight. We're always great to have more cargo showing up. So I want to talk a little bit about Juno because we talked a little, we, we hinted about it last week, um, but we didn't really go into too much detail, which is that Juno, the spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter for NASA, went into safe mode, and it's now out of safe mode thanks to work by engineers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and prime contractor Lockheed Martin. But they are both now investigating the root cause for this, they think, which is a software fault. Now, Juno was set to fire its main engine on October 19th to place itself from its current current 53 and a half day orbit into a 14 day science orbit, but valves in the engine are continuing to react slower than needed. So mission scientists and engineers are confident that if Juno does have to stay in this 53 and a half day orbit, that it will be able to accomplish all of its science goals. But a little bit of a set 
setback there because they were wanting to get a little bit closer. There's also some advantages to having this higher orbit where that you'll have more time to get the data down and other things like that. Um, but overall, seems like every spacecraft we send to Jupiter, there's a little bit of a technical glitch with it, just like they had with Galileo, where you have to overcome it a little bit, and we'll see how they do with Juno. So um, knowing NASA, they'll be able to do a very good job. All right, going back to Earth orbit. Space Mike, what have you got for us? This is actually a little bit of bad news. Uh, the Air Force on Monday announced that one of their uh, defense meteorological satellites broke apart in orbit. And this was the uh, satellite that was designated DMF, or excuse me, DMSP for the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program, Flight 12. And it launched on August 29th, 1994, and had the same faulty battery assembly that was on their F-13 or Flight 13 satellite that broke up last year in February. Now, when F-13 broke up last year, it was still in service, but F-12 that just recently broke up had been retired in 2008, which means that the Air Force burned off the satellite's remaining fuel, it released compressed gases, and it discharged the battery. And this also meant that they had no telemetry when the spacecraft uh, broke apart. So figuring out why it broke apart will be really hard to determine. Now, part of the good news about this is that the Air Force is only tracking one additional piece of debris in the vicinity of uh, F-12 satellite, whereas the F-13 satellite that broke apart last year produced 150 pieces of debris. And this is actually the third one of these, this series that, it, that uh, broke apart. Uh, the, the F-11 satellite broke up in 2004, and it produced 56 pieces of debris. So uh, whatever this one piece is that broke off of F-12, I'm, I'm glad that it didn't create a huge uh, debris field, but there is still the cascade effect. And uh, there are still six orbits, uh, excuse me, six satellites that are currently in orbit right now that have the same sort of faulty uh, battery assembly and that still might be at risk of uh, uh, breaking apart, even if they are uh, in service or not. So a little bit of bad news, but I'm glad it didn't produce more damage, at least not in, at the current time anyway. Yes, and I want to talk a little bit about one of my favorite spacecraft, uh, which is not in orbit around the Earth, it is on its way out of the solar system, and it's NASA's New Horizons spacecraft, which after 16 months of downlinking, it finally finished downlinking all of the data from its flyby of Pluto. Now, that's over 50 gigabits of data, and that ended at 948 coordinated universal time this past Tuesday, which marked when that last fresh data packet came down. Now, the reason that it took 16 months is because the average downlink speed is somewhere around 2,000 bits per second. So in other words, it's really slow. And also, that signal takes about five hours for it to reach the Earth after leaving the spacecraft. Now, the 16 months was built in to the mission to allow the downlink, and it's now on its way to fly by a, uh, a minor Kuiper Belt object in 2019. But just the amazing stuff that it brought us back from Pluto, and it, we're still going to be analyzing that data probably for the next decade, just mind-blowing stuff in what it was able to do, and just fantastic I really like Pluto, even though I don't think it's a planet, but you know, it's still uh, a fantastic place. And uh, great that we now have all of the data back from that highly successful flyby mission. So very, very cool stuff. And now I want to talk a little bit about some other cool images too. Mike? Yeah. Tell us about yeah, this one. This, uh, this goes back to Earth orbit. I, we, we're having a little battle here going back and forth between <laughs> Earth and the solar system. But uh, this is actually from the Tiangong-2 space station. They deployed a microsatellite that was about the size of a printer that was able to take pictures of the Tiangong complex with the Shenzhou-11 docked. And it returned this picture here that you see on screen. Now, this small spacecraft had a visible light camera and an infrared light camera. And it took over 300 images. But this is kind of the best one that they've uh, at least made public so far. Now, uh, this spacecraft also has an ammonia-based propulsion system. And it will linger around the station taking more pictures in the next few days of Tiangong-2 with Earth as a backdrop. I don't know if those are going to be color photos or more black and white photos. Um, this is called the, uh, the Bangjing satellite, I believe it's called. This is the second one in the series. And uh, the, it's an upgraded version from uh, the first one that flew with Shenzhou-7 back in 2008. So cool picture, and I'm really uh, excited to see the pictures of that. And it really reminds me of uh, the, the Russian Salyut program uh, back in the day. So it's cool to see those pictures and that they're already having a lot of success with it. So 
congratulations to China for, for the successful mission so far, and I hope everything else goes well with Tiangong too. Yeah, looking forward to what they're going to be able to do with that. So we are going to go ahead and go to a break, and when we come back from break, we've got Emery Stagmer, who's going to be talking to us about small stats. So stay tuned. Tomorrow continues right after this break. And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with our interview with Emery, I want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who've con contributed $10 or more to the specific episode. They're going to get access to our Slack channel. We've also got our Tomorrow producers. These are people who've contributed $5 or more to the uh, uh, this specific episode, and they're going to get access to free worldwide shipping from our swag store. So thank you to everyone who've contributed. If you'd like to help crowdfund this is a shows of tomorrow head on over to patreon.com slash tmro easy for me to say all right uh, this week we bring on a longtime viewer and uh, multiple guest emery stagmer he's going to be talking about small sets which i think is uh, appropriate based on the number of launchers that we've been talking about and all the different uh, uh, innovations that are happening in the small sat market and this is actually emery an area that you you work in like daily is it not Right. Yeah. Um, I'm a flight software engineer for satellite systems. And for the last three to five years, we've been talking to uh, internal and external customers within uh, Northrop Grumman about making really, really small satellites using the CubeSat form factor. Uh, I first became aware of the CubeSats uh, about 10 years ago. There's a CubeSat um, conference that's held every year at uh, Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. And uh, I went like 10 years ago and saw that the universities were doing some really interesting stuff with these super small satellites. Um, and then at the SmallSat conference in Utah three years ago, we started to hear about people who were looking, starting to look at this form factor for more operational units uh, where you could start to talk about, you know, high reliability, the kinds of reliability and longevity on a system that, you know, you would normally expect that of something the size of, you know, maybe a refrigerator. Um, but here, I've actually got a prop. You know, not like props, right? This is the size of a satellite that we're talking about. Actually, this is a little bit bigger. Wow. The CubeSat standard, right. The CubeSat standard is 10 centimeters. This is 11. Okay. And it's 10 centimeters tall. This is 13. Because I just measured it with my, you know, handy dandy caliper. Um, and... And so this is not like the power box or the the um, you know the avionics or the the propellant tank. This is the whole satellite, a one unit CubeSat. Now they make them in multiples, okay? So they make you know three tall, and that's a three U CubeSat. And if they make them you know three tall and two wide, that's a six U CubeSat, right? So we're talking about something you know this big and that wide. Right. So you're talking about, uh, you know, two cereal boxes for an entire mission. What can now, you do with something like that, though? I mean, you traditionally think of these giant satellites with huge solar arrays and huge powerful antennas. Trying to shrink that into something that is smaller than a Kleenex box uh, it seems like you have to give something up. So what utility do these CubeSats have? That's been the real interesting point is that the electronics, the optics um, and the kinds of science instruments that you want to be able to fly are getting smaller and smaller. And it's kind of like the reverse of the, of what we call the tyranny of the rocket equation, where every time something gets bigger on a rocket, everything else gets bigger. And then that thing gets bigger and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. Well, the reverse of that is also true. As soon as something gets smaller, everything gets smaller. And then, it, and then that gets smaller and smaller. Right. So it's kind of like the reverse. The smaller it gets, the smaller it gets. 
And so when you can start saying, oh, I can take out the mass of the optics or I can take out some of the mass for the electronics. Oh, well, then I don't need as much power or I don't need as big a reaction wheels or I don't need as much propellant. And so the satellites then get smaller and you start to get from, you know, a cubic meter satellite to a cubic foot satellite. Sorry, I'm mixing units. I know that's going to drive Jared crazy. <laughs> uh, but but you get that people understand, you know something this big, then you get start to get down to something this big. And then you start talking about, well, who's making systems? Who's making electronics for these things? Um, and what we've found over the last three to five years is that there are multiple producers who are making electronics for these. And unfortunately, the, the, um, the reliability and, and the success of those missions has been significantly lacking. Uh, they have a better than 50% failure rate. Hmm. And sometimes the missions are put it in orbit and, and prove that you got it in orbit and talked to it. Okay. And that mission fails, which means you never heard from it at all. You know, they deployed it into orbit. You never got it back. You never heard anything. So you don't know what happened. Um, things like, um, LightSail 2, for instance, had a software problem. And so you've got these kinds of uh, both hardware and software failures that really limit the reliability of these kinds of missions. And generally, you know, they work for six months or a year, but they eventually, you know, you're flying low cost, low quality components. And so, you know, you just can't have a reliability for satellite that lasts three, five, eight years with a, with a predictable you know, lifetime. So that's where Northrop Grumman started to take a look in the last couple of years at, well, what would it really take to uh, take the kinds of reliability that we've built into systems uh, for the last 20 or 30 years where we've never had an on-orbit failure? You know, um, I've worked on, I've lost count, 12 or 15 missions in the last 20 years. We've never had an on-orbit failure. We've never had a piece of hardware fail. We've never had a piece of software fail. Um, and so if you can bring that kind of reliability to the CubeSat environment, now you're starting to talk about being able to have a satellite that has a three to five year reliability that only costs single digit millions where they used to cost a hundred million plus. So Northrop Grumman right now is working on taking, uh, you know, in my notes it says 24 years, 30 missions of heritage of successful satellite missions, but they're generally these larger satellites uh, that you know fill up you know, a good chunk of this studio space, but taking that technology and compressing it down into something that's more of a CubeSat size. So you can actually reduce the size and cost of everything and potentially deploy a lot of these all at once instead of just one per mission. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the kinds of deployers that people are, are building, uh, people like uh, Planetary Systems and some others, uh, where they can bolt these things onto almost everything that's flying, uh, including the space station, the Atlas V rockets, the Falcon 9 rockets, the Soyuz rockets, I mean, just everything. Um, and so we're seeing, we're starting to see numbers on the order of a couple of hundred satellites a year that are getting put up into low Earth orbit in these CubeSat form factors. So a couple questions from the chat room, if we could, uh, which is you, you talked about a greater than 50% failure rate on a lot of these CubeSats. Um, what is the collision? This is from Destructor 1701. What is the collision risk on these little things? Um, do they have, is there like a keep out zone for these or is it just kind of you launch it and just hope for the best? Well, they launch them um, on a sequence. And so uh, the deployers will uh, pop them off at a, at a predetermined time in the launch profile. So um, they're, they're not getting, they're not interacting with each other. They're generally ejected at uh, some numbers of meters per second, uh, single digit meters per second away from the rocket. So they're not, they're not interacting with each other. They're just either things aren't deploying or the electronics fail to operate. Um, generally those are always launched off. And so there's a deployer um, pin puller inside the the uh, the ejector um, that that you know shoots these things out essentially, but it pulls a pin as it goes, right? And so when you pull that pin, closes a switch, and the thing turns on. But if it doesn't turn on, you mission over, you know. 
But then we still have a space debris problem with uh, something like that. Are these at a low enough speed and altitude where they just kind of come back after a month or two or not even that and just burn up in the atmosphere? Sure. The, uh, the total um, orbital inertia mass and is, is very in, involved in the, um, the, the amount of energy that the satellite has. And so the smaller the satellite is, the more that atmosphere and things like that will affect it. And so it'll, it'll come back in, you know, into the, re-enter the atmosphere um, much earlier than a larger satellite, even in the same orbit. Now, at Northrop Grumman, you're working on more than just the software control side of it, right? It's kind of a whole package for control, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. We're building an entire avionics system that we can use as the central, uh, you know, piece of computer hardware and power systems in these super small satellites, um, being able to bring, um, you know, the larger engineering organization and with a deep understanding of space physics and physics reliability uh, means that we're able to do some things that are pretty fancy. Um, the, the biggest, most expensive processor that you can fly in space right now is made by BAE Systems. And it's that processor card is a whole card. It's got memory and everything on it. But that processor card is multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars and runs at 100 megahertz and has a single core processor. <laughs> I know that's just mind-boggling to I mean, somebody. Your, your phone, at your phone has more power yeah. than that. My phone has thirty times as much power <laughs> than that, and I don't even know how much more memory it has. But that's the processor you're using to do. You worked on things like Elcross. Is that a similar processor to yeah. what you used for going that to the moon? That was the processor. Yeah, that was the processor we used on Elcross. That's the processor that we built the avionics not only for Elcross but also for LRO. Elcross was essentially a copy of LRO's avionics and power system, right? We basically just duplicated it and, and uh, bolted it on a, what's called an ESPA ring. I don't remember what that stands for. I'm sorry, it's an acronym. Um, but it's basically the politely known as a sewer pipe uh, that, that hooks onto the top and then we bolted boxes around the outside. Um, it's the same diameter. It's essentially the interface adapter ring that goes in between the upper stage and the primary payload. So it was the adapter ring that sat in between the Centaur upper stage and the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And what we did is we bolted electronics and thrusters on the outside of that ring and made a satellite out of it. But it's the same electronics as, as LCROSS. So LCROSS and LRO both flying this RAD 750 processor. So what we're doing in the CubeSat environment is we're taking a, a new processor uh, by a different company and we're making our own processor card. We make printed wiring boards, you know, does not only design them, we have a manufacturing facility at our location. We made, to say that we made the avionics, we made the processing cards uh, and the power system cards that went in those boxes. So we're applying that same level of understanding, reliability, engineering to a processor card that's this big and that thick, right? And so you have a processor card, then you have a mezzanine memory card, and then you have a solar array module interface card and a power switching card. And you can stack them up in kind of multiple, you need more, you need more memory, you need more power, you need more solar arrays, you can add more slices. But just that simple stack is three quarters of a unit of a CubeSat. So it's 77.5 centimeters by 10 by 10 centimeters. So one of the reasons you have very large satellites is uh, when you're out in space, you don't have a magnetosphere to help protect against radiation. So you have right. to protect, uh, I mean, big, heavy boxes to protect against radiation because uh, radiation whipping through a processor can, can really screw it up. Uh, do you have any sort of, uh, this is, comes from uh, Anonym, I believe is how you pronounce that. Uh, in small sets, do you ha use any sort of radiation protection uh, for hardened controllers or processors, or do you use redundancy, or do you have something to protect against uh, space-based radiation? A little bit of all of that. You have two different kinds of radiation that you have to worry about. You have single event upsets, which is an ionizing piece of radiation that can flip a bit in a satellite, and then you have something called um, TID, total ionizing dose, and that's how long a piece of electronics essentially can survive in a given radiation environment. Um, it can soak up so much radiation, and generally that's in um, kilorads, thousands of rads. So um, we, we start talking about having a reliable 
thing that'll that'll live in space when we start talking about 100 to 300 k rad. Um, the processor, uh, some of the processors that we've used in the past are mega rad, but the new um, the new memory systems that we are now putting on these cubesats are mega rad. So you're talking about a million rads of total ionizing dose before those things uh, will have a problem. So they can survive a very long time, and their tolerance to um, single event upsets is very, very high. Uh, this one comes from Blue Gl Glacius. Uh, you talked about uh, the Light Sail Project, which is a planetary society, um, solar sail, essentially, uh, using... And, oh, yeah, yeah, there you go, so yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so they flew I've that. Never one. <laughs> uh, mentioned there was a software fault, but they, they was essentially successful missions, uh, plural. Uh, other than sails, are there any propulsion systems that can send cubesats from low Earth orbit to lunar orbit? Because uh, you, you, there's a lot of uh, uh, change in velocity oh, required for that. Oh, there's a bunch. Um, and in fact, they're they're looking at um, both uh, ion drives, um, and uh, I've seen one that actually uses uh instead of xenon uh uses iodine uh that one is stupendous uh the iodine drive is really cool um i've seen some systems that have uh many hundreds of meters of change in velocity uh, meters per second and change in velocity so yeah you could actually fly these small cubesats um out to out to lunar um out to geosynchronous that's a big idea right now like the Chinese satellite that you just showed along with you guys showed in the new segment along with the uh, Tiangong 2 the little the little satellite I mean it's um, that's a probably they didn't really say how big it was but it's in the cubic foot range you know multiple maybe bigger slightly bigger than a cubic foot um, and um, yeah, being able to, to then do that kind of observation, it's one of the things that a lot of the agencies are looking to do is, is have these super small satellites. Uh, they're less expensive. They're a little bit more expendable. Um, they're harder to detect. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> For now. Uh, that, For now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, it, you know, if you're actively broadcasting, you're fairly easy to detect because, you know, you're emitting RF radiation because that's how you have to talk to the ground. Um, but yeah, so there, the people would like to be able to go inspect other satellites. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's, there's any, but any agency and any commercial entity that's looking to do anything in space, uh, with earth observation, uh, science observations, communications, satellite to satellite kinds of th things. Everybody's looking at CubeSats. So I got two questions that kind of relate to each other. One is from uh, Paco De Niro, uh, which is, why aren't people trying to send a CubeSat to the moon? Although I, I think maybe they are. And the second one is from Cogen7, which is, are there any plans for Lagrange point CubeSats? So, uh, all right, so maybe people are planning on sending CubeSats to the moon, but why haven't they gone there yet? Um, I think it's just a matter of you had to have a satellite that had sufficient reliability uh, because to get to the moon, especially with a CubeSat, unless you're hitchhiking on something that's already going to the moon, uh, you've got to have a lot of delta V. You've got to be able to have a large change in velocity in order to get from Earth orbit to lunar orbit, even through lunar flyby. Um, and so it takes a long time. It takes months if you're going to use uh, an ion drive to get that far. And so you've got to have a reliability that's going to, you know, not only take you months to get there, but then be able to survive months once you're up there. And the moon's a much more harsh radiation environment. You said you're outside the magnetosphere. Uh, you have a lot more um, direct cosmic rays. You're in the solar wind. The solar wind hits things like the solar wind hits the moon at a million miles an hour and has all kinds of ionized particles on it, including protons. Uh, so the moon's radiation environment's pretty harsh. Uh, are there any um, um, plans to take what Northrop Grumman is doing and just uh, allow anyone to buy it? Is that kind of how that works right now? So tomorrow wants to build a CubeSat and I want to use what you guys are working on. Am I able to do that or is this for more government agencies, uh, larger customers kind of thing? No, it's pretty much any customer. Uh, but what, it, it's still a fairly expensive proposition, right? This is, we're not bringing the price of CubeSats down to $5,000. We're still in the $100,000 million range here. If you want to buy a CubeSat from an organization like um, ISI Space or uh, Pumpkin, 
they have uh, CubeSat Kit is, is the pumpkin place to go buy CubeSat systems, and um, CubeSat Shop is the place to go. So I think that's that's ISI space. Um, you're talking about being able to buy all the pieces that you need to fly a satellite for, I think the number's about $65,000 for a turnkey piece of hardware. Okay? That's a but, lot lower than I thought you were going to say, actually. But... The reliability, it doesn't come with flight software. you got to provide that yourself. It doesn't mm. provide, provide an instrument. It does provide power, and, and I think that that, is, that price might even include uh, might even include solar rays. Um, trying to remember off the top of my head. Um, less than $100,000. However, if you really want to be able to talk about, oh, I want a satellite that's going to last me three to five years or eight years, you know, oh, I want to go to the moon or I want to go to Mars, now you're talking about single-digit millions of dollars. But that's still far less. So if you're going to the moon or Mars, that's, that's a slightly different mission profile, right? That's still far less than what we, what we would ever spend on anything else that we've ever used to go to the oh, moon yeah. or Mars by, oh, yeah, yeah. by a large percentage. Oh, yeah. El Cross was probably one of the cheapest missions that ever went to the moon. And that mission was $100 million. So you can do this for 100 times less, potentially, 100 times less using CubeSats that have the capability of staying out there uh, for quite a while. Would you be able to do the same things that LCROSS was able to do, or would you have to li limit the scope of that mission uh, just due to the size of the vehicle? I don't, know about the, uh, I don't know about the optics that we actually used for the... Of course, with LCROSS, we had pretty good-sized thrusters, right, because we were trying to control the Centaur. So... Uh, we were moving the Centaur upper stage around, and it weighs two tons. So you've got to have a lot of propellant when you're going to do that, and that starts to drive your mass. Um, if I just wanted to go and take pictures, um, actually, you can get a pretty decent camera with uh, electronics and optics that will survive, and you can put that in a 6U CubeSat, and you could do a pretty slick mission to the moon. Man, I'm seeing a Kickstarter campaign here. Wouldn't that be cool? A, a crowdfunded <laughs> yeah, yeah. mission to the moon, grab some pictures of like an Earthrise type thing. Uh, that seems like it'd be all sorts of awesome. And you could do it yeah. for probably a million or less, not including the launcher, right? So yeah. the, the launcher is kind of the hard part. But we have, you know, we've got all these small CubeSat launchers coming online. We've got the Electron rocket. Um, uh, we've got Launcher 1 from Virgin Galactic. There are a bunch of, I, I, there's a number, actually I think you sent me the number, something like 30 uh, different launchers. Oh, I can't believe how many launchers were, were currently in development. It's crazy. <laughs> Is that because there's a huge new market for these small satellites? That's, uh, you know, now that we're able to make these CubeSats, is everyone kind of clamoring to have these lower cost satellites? Uh, is that where all of this is coming from or is this just a bit yeah. of a bubble? It's, it's coming at us. It's right on the horizon, coming across the horizon at us. Um, Time-wise, you're talking about a year or so away. Um, and, you know, like I said, there's hundreds of those CubeSats flying now. Um, you know, so people want to be able to launch those things today. Actually, for the launch vehicle market, the launch vehicles are actually, they're actually running behind. Uh, that market exists for them today. Um, NASA's paying to launch things. Every other government agency is paying to launch things. Any, any agency that does anything in space is paying to launch this stuff. So. Uh, Neuropilot asks, do you think the 12U, lar in quotes, large uh, CubeSats have more utility than several smaller CubeSats? It all depends on the science package, right? Um, the, the size of the optics that you need to fly or um, if you have to have a lot of power for things like Say you wanted to fly a radar mission on a, on a CubeSat, you could potentially do that. So it's power um, and it's heat and it's optics are really driving the size. Um, yeah, so it really depends on the science that you need to do. Uh, Dutta actually asked from our control room, are the orbits of a CubeSat predictable or is there any way to adjust the orbit and or attitude? Now, you mentioned some drives, but they're fairly low powered. So can you make course corrections with the current propulsion systems on board or is that very limited? Uh, you can make course corrections. And the thing about the CubeSats is they only weigh, you know, one kilogram per CubeSat unit on, on average, right? So a 6U CubeSat is only going to weigh six kilograms uh, which is about 14 pounds rough and dirty. So, I mean, you're talking about a satellite that you can pick up and hold in your hands. I mean, not only is it that big, it doesn't weigh tons. It weighs, you know, you know, 15 pounds. Um, and so being able to move that around, um, you know, there are stock 
CubeSat sized propulsion systems that people are selling today that you could bolt on to the avionics and the science package that you want and be able to get a pretty significant delta V. Uh, those things are commercially available um, for, for both large and small changes in velocity. All right, we're going to have to break in a moment, but there was a really interesting comment that just came in. Uh, something that I hadn't considered before, and this comes from Kay McCoy, which is, um, is there any sense that maybe the CubeSat framework could become the standard for even larger satellites, that everything will start to be built in multiples of 10 centimeter sizes? So even these huge, huge satellites for, say, the National Reconnaissance Office will actually be built on a common CubeSat framework, and they end up being huge still, but there's this common framework between all satellites that go all the way down to 10 centimeters. Does it seem like a viable thing, or by the time you get to these large sat satellites, are they so specialized that that doesn't make any sense? Yeah, I think when you get above about 27U, which would be 30 by 30 by 30 centimeters, beyond that, then you start to talk about it doesn't make sense to use those stock frameworks, although it may make sense to use the kind of avionics that we are building. Um, our avionics system is really quite capable and will use the exact same flight software that we've been working on for two decades. Uh, it's flown on, I don't even know how many, 17 missions, I think is our, our stock, uh, you know, marketing pitch. It's 17th generation flight software. It already runs on this CubeSat uh, architecture. The other really, the really, really fancy thing we did, uh, our electrical engineers are some of the best anywhere, and we can now look at using power on these satellites that's greater than 500 watts uh, on, a, on a 3U CubeSat. Uh, generally, those things have been 10 watts to 50 watts. Now we're talking about 500 and above. So are you guys providing, uh, so you're providing more than just the software and prop. You, you have an entire framework for the CubeSat then as well. I mean, yep. it sounds like, right? So you have power generation. All I need to do, I, I buy your package from you, and all I need to do is put my instrument on board, it sounds like. Yep, we can provide that integration for you and all the way up to, you know, integrating it for you. And can you provide my instrumentation as well, including my optics? So if I want to just buy the whole thing from you, I say make it like this and you'll, you'll just sell me the whole thing, or do I need to do that last step? Of course. <laughs> awesome. Where, <laughs> where can, uh, so uh, we'll, we'll, normally I have people just kind of go, where, where can I get more information on Northrop Grumman? Although that, that's fairly simple, but where can people go for more information on Northrop Grumman and what you're doing with CubeSats, as well as more information on you, because I know that you do a lot of things in the uh, kind of the new space community. Um, I'm, I'm pretty uh, readily available, uh, twitter.com slash vaxheadroom, facebook.com slash vaxheadroom. My, uh, my, you can see behind me um, the various electronics and uh, things that are running behind me. I'm actually up in my recording studio uh, at home, and so my recording studio is untiedmusic.com and Untied Music Studio on YouTube. As an interesting note, I think you're one of the few people who has music on the moon right now. If I remember I, right. Well... Yeah, I had, uh, we, we got to put a piece of music as a memory test pattern <laughs> on, uh, on the processor card on the L-Cross mission. So, uh, yeah, if the double EEPROMs survived, it's, uh, it's on the moon. <laughs> I don't think they survived. That, that, no, that was a, shattered pretty well. That was well. a fairly energetic event uh, on purpose. It was a fairly energetic event, but still very cool that you were yeah. able to do that. Uh, Vax, always a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, for those who don't know, Vax also came on and did a segment on Sea Dragon, which was an absolutely, you know, we need to do another one of those because it felt like you only had time to do some of the information. It, it would be great to do like a refresher because, and compare Sea Dragon to SpaceX's uh, BFR that they announced. I think that would be a lot of fun just to kind of do size comparisons yeah. and power comparisons. Uh, but that is a fascinating episode. I think that was last year, if I remember right. It might have been two yep. years ago. Uh, but yeah, uh, so search for uh, um, TMRO Sea Dragon, you'll find it. Uh, Vax, as always, thank you for taking time out of your Saturday and coming on the show. It was, it was fascinating and awesome. Absolutely. Love being here. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, comments from last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. 
and we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before I do the Patreon slates, uh, you should see what Jared has to do. Go to the other camera uh, to get, stay out of my camera shot. That's <laughs> okay. So here's me sitting regularly. Here's right. your camera there's shot. There's my camera shot. Oh, look, uh, it's me right here. So then he oh. does. He does that. He does that. And oh, look, magic! My camera shots. I just. Wow. I, I looked over and I saw him go whoop right as we uh, came on screen. It was hilarious. <laughs> all right, I want to give a huge shout out to all the patrons of tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who've contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. They're going to get access to absolutely everything, uh, including our Slack channel. Uh, we've also got our Patreon producers. These are people who are uh, contributing $5 or more. So they're going to get access to our swag store, uh, uh, free shipping from our swag store. Uh, which is uh, pretty awesome. And then we've also got our Patreon Plus subscribers. These are people who've contributed $2.50 or more. They're going to get access to After Dark early, so as soon as that is available on demand. And we've also got our Patrons. These are people who've contributed between $1 and $2.49 for this specific episode. These are, uh, they're going to get access to the Google Hangouts when we have those, and of course, their name in the show. For more information on how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com. Slash T M R O. All right, uh, that was uh, that was a lot of fun. I would oh, love have. I'm totally covering Mike. Sorry. You know, and, oh, you're fine. And, well, wait, wait, wait. No, <laughs> you just need to lean like Jared did. You just need to lean. There you go. Come on, right, everybody. I'll lean this here. way. There we go. <laughs> All right, Everybody's Capcom. <laughs> uh, I have officially derailed the show. You're welcome, Internet. Thanks. Uh, Capcom, <laughs> get us started with some uh, comments from our last week's show, which was. Mastin on Moon. Yeah, so uh, this first comment comes off of YouTube from Rocket Cat. <laughs> I like this comment. It says, uh, I want to be a Dave Mastin when I grow up. You totally can, yeah. right? I mean, he, he just loved doing rockets, and so he kind of did some stuff uh, and then put all of his money basically in. I'm, I'm putting words in his mouth. He's never actually said he put all his money into it. But put his own money into Mastin Space Systems and started it on his own. Uh, you know, you look at someone like Elon Musk, you know, did PayPal, did X.com, built these things, and then built SpaceX.com. You don't have to be a billionaire to start a rocket company, especially with, you know, as Emory was mentioning, the cost of these satellites is coming down. And with that, we need to reduce the cost of launch services to coordinate. You don't want to have a $65,000 CubeSat and then spend $100 million to launch it. That's absurd. <laughs> right. So we need these yes. low-cost launchers, and we're going to need a lot of them because as these prices come down, I'm of the opinion a lot more people are going to want to do cool things with them. As uh, uh, Chris Radcliffe said in the last uh, segment, uh, what Patreon level do we need to reach before tomorrow set is a thing? Right. Um, yeah, actually, uh, there is a level where we could do that. It's probably 10,000 an episode, which yeah. is a lot. I mean, that's uh, not quite 10x what we're at right now, but is a viable number. It is a number we could reach. And then imagine we could launch a CubeSat using some of the technology that uh, Vax mentioned from Northrop Grumman and actually have it, oh my, I mean, imagine that, right? The, the citizens tomorrow launch a CubeSat, we would send it to the moon, we would take pictures of our future tomorrow studios mm -hmm. on the moon and yes. get that perfect, because mm -hmm. we want to get the earth rise in the background, right? Duh. So we get that perfect yeah. shot of where we're going to put the studios. Uh, and the nice thing is, because of the way it all uh, lines, it, it, the earth rises just like constantly be there. It'd be great. Yeah. So, all right. All Fantastic. Right. Next up, Capcom. We have one. To... Go ahead. No, what? What? 
Oh, it'd be cool to have one in uh, geosynchronous orbit with some sort of transponder that we could have some sort of dedicated signal with, too. Bo oh, you mean studio or just uh, CubeSat or both? We should do both. Uh, both, yes. Yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe one at a little grand point just looking for upcoming fueling sites. We could do some. <laughs> Actually, you know, it would be really cool. Yeah, uh, it would be really great, although I'm not sure if we could get the optics because optics are heavy, right? Glass is heavy. Yes. Uh, so, but it would be really cool if we could get a CubeSat that could then kind of um, look at where rockets are launching from, and traditionally, when you watch a rocket launch, you watch it from the butt end of the rocket and you see it go away from you. Wouldn't it be cool if you could see it come towards you instead? That'd be awesome. If you could, if you could get the launch from space. So it'd actually have to be like as low as we could get it, kind of like low horizon sort of thing. It'd probably only last a year, so we'd have to launch these once every year or so. I don't know, what the, I haven't figured out the timing, but wouldn't that be cool? That'd be sweet. Yeah, just be able to watch the rocket come at you. That would be way better than my streaming of going to participate <laughs> in Britain, so. I don't know. You, you bring a fun element to that. <laughs> Fog. Fog. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Next up, Capcom. Uh, next one comes off of YouTube. From, this is from TNM001. Is that tomorrow one? No. No. Tom, tom right? Yeah. Tomorrow one. Yeah, well, that's what it is now. Right. Uh, I like the comment about, it's always 20 years away. Now, let's be clear. It's not the 20 years that's bugging me slash us. It's the knowledge that they are not serious about it. It's just far enough away that they don't have to actually do it. So Musk may not get to Mars in 10 years, but he may actually do it in 20 years or leave something behind that will make it the next guy to finish it. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's this kind of, I'm of the opinion that if anything's over 10 years away, then it's just not, they're not similar. They're not serious about it, right? Uh, you look at the, the JFK speeches, you know, we choose to do, put a man on the moon in the next decade. Right. Or how did he pronounce Decade. it? Decade. De Decade, yeah. Yes. Uh, and uh, there's something magic about that 10-year number. If you can do it less than 10 years, that's even better. But right. anything over 10 years, we kind of lose the ability to um, care. I, I, not care. It's difficult to see that far down the line. It, it really it is. Just is. It, it's, it's difficult. Like, at that point, it's just like, oh, well, that's that's, That's so, so far, far off. I don't need to worry about it now. Yeah. Yeah. And you just you you it loses its luster the moment you say it's more than ten years away. Right. Even at ten years, that's still pretty far. You got you. The more we can compress that time and be like, this is going on now, which is where um, I have a love hate relationship with Blue Origin because well they do. So yeah, I, I realize that I talk out of both sides of my mouth, and and, and that it's a conundrum. So uh, I know, right? You do. This yeah, side and then this side is weird. Yeah. Uh, so the the argument I make is uh, I want an organization like Blue Origin to be more open. We want to cheer along. We want to to be a part. Feel like we're part of it. Right. And, you know, uh, and I I could argue that that helps you get better engineers or more engineers or whatever you need because people are aware of it, but they're excited for what you're doing and they're doing it for the cause. Blah 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 blah. On the flip side of that is. Um, if you're talking about what you're doing, but what you're doing is so far off that you can't, again, kind of comprehend it and you don't care, mm -hmm. that's just as bad. And so we're all like, hey, we want Blue Origin to be more open, but Blue Origin's being super secretive because they don't want, I don't know why, but the advantage of that is now, when they go to release something, it's really compressed timelines. Right. So they're talking about, hey, let's go to uh, <laughs> the moon, uh, you know, or let's get an orbital vehicle. Their timelines are a couple of years as opposed to five, ten years. Okay, what'd you see? Uh, somebody in the chat room, Citizen87515, said, I was married for ten years and it seemed to last forever. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Anyhow. Anyhow, they, yeah, it, I, yeah. I mean, you see what uh, I'm saying? We, we've said we've said a lot, right? Uh, there's, it's you damned if you do, you damned if you don't, right? Yeah, you, yeah, exactly. You don't say anything for a really long time, and then you do stuff, and then we're like, well, why did you tell us before? Yeah, and kinda, then if you right. like say stuff ahead of time, and then you don't actually produce it, it's like, well, I mean, I can't believe you now. It's, so, it's like yeah. <laughs> we're so finicky about that. I know, I know. So my apologies to Blue Origin, but at the same time, do what I want, not what I say. Yes. <laughs> or how's that? Do as I say, I not as I do. Do as I say, not as I do. Whatever, whatever right. that is. So, yeah. yeah. Well, like I, that. you know, here's what it really comes down to. What we want is we want them to announce something, begin working on it, and complete it in under a year. No matter how, <laughs> no matter how grand the right, plan is. Right. That's what we is, actually want. Right. right. That's what we want, and that's a super duper unreasonable request, but we can still want it nonetheless. <laughs> Ultimately, I think that's what I'm saying here. Pretty much. Thanks, yeah. Apple. <laughs> yes. Thanks, <laughs> Apple. They're the ones who caused this problem because of the yearly iPhone refresh, and then they refresh the iPhone, and we're like, 
Ah, oh, this supercomputer in my pocket is uninspiring. At least I do. So, all right, next up. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> next comment. First world problems. Right, comes off of Reddit uh, from Brandon Mark. Uh, loving the imagery of a super tanker seen in the distance, beached in the desert, slowly <laughs> being converted into a spaceship that, quote unquote, pops a wheelie in order to launch <laughs> with a mass in space systems logo on the side and a pirate flag atop. Well, the pirate flag was my idea, but I think it, it, you can't have it without the pirate flag. I feel like yeah. that's required. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah, yep. pretty much. Uh, paging user bag tagger, if you're looking for fun idea to add to your gallery, maybe try this one out. Yeah, I, I, I did. I, you know, Dave Master was talking about turning, converting the super tanker. Yeah. Also, um, I found this out. I'm going to call everyone out on it. I apparently misheard him, and uh, I'm going to tell this story. Go ahead. Uh, I misheard him uh, say that they were um, looking or talking about this over a launch, and there had recently been an Atlas V launch. And I thought right. to myself, well, I guess it's interesting that you went as a group to that launch. I didn't think it was from Vandenberg, but all right, maybe it was. Uh, he said lunch, not launch. Yeah, they all went out to eat. They went out to eat, which makes way more sense. For like uh, that midday <laughs> meal? But he rolled yeah. with it anyhow, and he's like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I was so just I, so th thank you, Dave, for making me not look like a total idiot. Clearly. Uh, but they went out to lunch, <laughs> not launch. In all fairness, we are in the space industry, and yeah. th there is a chance they went to launch, too. I was about to say, <laughs> going to launch is often a thing that you actually do. Uh, yes, absolutely. So. <laughs> but, so that is what I heard. But that's not what happened. They went to lunch and talked about this. But that yeah. is still a very cool conversation to have over lunch, um, turning a super tanker into, uh, yeah. A, a vehicle, I'll say we went so. to lunch after the fact, and our conversations were equally as intriguing. It was pretty awesome. Quite. Yes. Yep. So, all right. Quite, next quite. up. Uh, last comment comes off of Patreon from a Michael Franz. Uh, hey, thanks for the reminder, Benjamin. Uh, our... I was uh, reminding them that it's a five-month five -month, uh, show this Five show month, which is, means that they're going to have to, there's an extra payment mm -hmm. this month. Yes. So, uh, are there any more pictures of the new studio? The ones above the are the first I've seen, but maybe I missed them. Ah, so one of the advantages of being a patron is that you get access to some of the behind the scenes thing. Now, your level of access depends on your patronage. So, uh, so the neat thing is that um, uh, the Citizens that are um, premier members, they get access to our Slack channel. And for better or worse, you get real time data from like all of us. Cause we're, yeah, everyone's laughing. Cause I mean, maybe we'll talk about tomorrow. Maybe we won't. Um, yeah. I was at the Tesla event the other day and I'm just posting pictures of the Tesla event in the Slack channel. Uh, because but, it was awesome. Uh, don't even, was, I know, like, I know, don't I know, apologize I for that. Yeah. As soon as you oh, said that glass deal. was heavy and you were talking about small sets, I was like, actually, you could take the photovoltaics and the glass because of the thing and then you could make the small sets out of the same thing, like Solar City Tesla thing that oh, yeah. they did and that would be really cool. Yeah. But I didn't want to. Say anything, but so, that would be really cool. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> thanks. It is. So uh, that that's at the premier level, which is ten dollars per episode. And then as you go down, uh, we have been building our new uh, studio, and, which you uh, can't see, but we're staring yeah, at right now. Right. So we're looking at the cameras, and on the other side of it. So it's, what's hilarious? Uh, actually, Dada, go to that. He's trying to bring up the image. Uh, he told me to stretch because he doesn't have the image. So uh, That's fairly only. accurate, though. It is a big, gigantic black, <laughs> black hole ball. that yeah. we're staring yeah. at. That's, that's pretty cool. So that's, that's so, pretty, uh, pretty great. It, yeah, if you're not a patron, that's basically what you're going to see. But for our patrons, we actually did, uh, you know, Dada, you don't have to call it up at this point. Um, for our patrons, we did, uh, uh, unless you have magic superpowers, and you were almost there. He He's working he on it. He has magic superpowers. Keep going. For our patrons, uh, <laughs> we did release a single picture of the studio after we had gotten through, uh, we've got the background of it complete. Well, complete's too strong of a word. We've got the background painted black. Uh, for our Slack members, you yes. actually have seen the CAD drawings, um, like the financials on all of it and everything else. For our producers in below, we actually simply said, hey, look, isn't this cool? And we released a time lapse, which is pretty awesome. So yes. if you're at the, um, actually, I think all patrons got access to the time lapse. So you can actually see it. This is pretty uh, cool. Now, this is what it looks like now. Uh, so we are on the left side of that screen facing the big, huge black wall, which was beige prior to this. And it didn't have that curve on the right-hand side, uh, which is pretty cool. Now, um, there, that's just 
part, like we're, we're obviously nowhere near done. That's just kind of the background initial work that needed to occur. There's going to be a lot more stuff. In fact, when the set's done, you really won't see much, if any, of that black paint, which uh, just goes to show how much work is going into this brand new interview set. It's going to be awesome. Yes. And part of the reason we keep <laughs> mucking with the news segment and kind of playing with the format uh, is that it gets its own set as well. Uh, and it's going to actually not be part of that set. It's its own totally different set, and I think it's going to make it a more fun and dynamic show, and we're using the rest of this season to play with the format to see what really works before we drop them in the new set and go, okay, here you go, because when we hit uh, Orbit 10, Episode 1, I want it to be one good, cohesive, like, oh my gosh, that was awesome kind of show. So forgive me, we're going to misstep between now and the end of December, and we're going to do things that work and we're going to do things that don't work, uh, but your constructive criticism on what works and what doesn't work is appreciated, uh, and why. Right? Not just like, I don't like that because it's different. That's a dumb reason to not like it. Yeah. There has to be a legit reason, like, it didn't flow because this was, you know, X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. I would love that feedback. Benjamin at tmro.tv. Uh, just let me know what you think. Uh, for those who are uh, Premier members, drop it in the Slack channel. Or, of course, feel free to leave it in the comments on YouTube, wherever else. And speaking of that, uh, we're going uh, uh, to close out the show. Uh, After Dark is up next. For those of you watching live, uh, just stay tuned. You'll get that. Uh, for everyone else, uh, it'll be available on demand in about four weeks, unless you're a Patreon Plus subscriber, and we'll make that available as soon as possible. And so. next week, we have Jim Kentrell from oh. Vector Space Systems. Yes, and that's I'm super excited for that. Because, me too. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about small sets. And the reason we're talking about that is this is an industry that's just getting ready to uh, explode as the flourish. wrong flourish. Flourish. So. You don't want to say explode in the rocket industry, but it's getting ready to flourish. <laughs> uh, so I'm really, really excited about what Vector Space Systems is doing. So that'll be up uh, next week. Um, and last comment, I realize I shouldn't, is uh, we have two uh, guest shows uh, slots available for December, and that's it. That's the rest of the shows for this year. So if you have someone that you want to see, uh, we've contacted a few different people who haven't been able to quite fill those slots yet. But if there's a company that you work for, a company that you're aware of, or something you want us to see, bring on the show. Leave it in the comments or email me, benjamin at tmro.tv. Thank you so much. See you next week.